Actually, I think this is a very important moment in all of our histories. We stand, in my view, at a crossroads. We stand at a time that many things are changing around us. And the optimism that came in 1989 after the fall of the Berlin Wall, an open world, a world of harmony, actually isn't there anymore. Current geopolitical changes make that we think again in political blocks. Trade may be affected. The way we view technology is seriously affected. If I take you back 100 years, more than half of the world population was suffering from malnutrition. The land was still ploughed by animals and worked by hand. What are changes we have seen today? Our food is more diverse, there is more food at a lower price than ever before. Food is safer than it ever was, and yet, yet there is a profound feeling of unease about our food, about agriculture, about the way we use our land. Climate change, erosion of soil, uh, the lack of water, the quality of water, they all seem to be very close to us suddenly. But there is no solution for the future of agriculture and food without looking again at what science can offer. But here's the difference. In the past, we didn't really think about some of the impacts of scientific developments. We didn't really know what the unintended side effects would be. Think of all the chemicals that were used. Nobody knew really what their effects on the long term on aquatic ecosystems would have been. There was no evidence, there was no idea, there was no way to actually get a sense of that. But today we know much more. And today we should use science in a very responsible way. And there are fantastic opportunities today. Please join our next seminar in the Catalyst of Change series on December 13th. Welcome to, <clears throat> welcome to the Catalyst of Change, Women Leaders in Science Seminar Series. There is interpretation available in Spanish, French, and Hindi. To access the interpretation, you choose the language of your preference by clicking the translation button at the base of your Zoom screen. This seminar will be recorded and made available on the CIMIT webcast. We invite you to follow us in LinkedIn, YouTube, and social media using the hashtag Women's Science for the Catalyst of Change Women Leaders in Science Seminar Series. On the screen, you will see the QR code that will give you access to Slido for submitting questions and comments to be addressed in the Q&A session. Today, we will be hearing from a very distinguished leader in international agriculture research and development, Luis Fresco. Right after her presentation, Luis Fresco will have a conversation with Rahel Acefa, Regional Project Manager for Africa at CIMIT. Now, I would like to welcome Brian Goberts, Director General of CIMIT, to officially open the event and welcome our distinguished speaker, Luis Fresco. Dr. Goberts, the floor is yours. Thank you, Isabel, and good day, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this, la this last of the year's Catalyst of Change, Women Leaders in Science series. At CIMIT, we are hosting a TED Talk meets fireside chat style series on women leaders, because we want more women leaders in science institutions like, our, like ours. And you can't be what you can see. So in order to achieve that goal, we want broader representation and gender balance in science. We need to provide more opportunities to hear from women leaders' life journeys, lessons, and insights. In this series, we highlight, therefore, leaders in all so uh, sorts of capacities, fields, and disciplines, from uh, high on the top, to developing new ways of working in the community with the communities. Today, our speaker is Luis Fresco, and she is a catalyst of change. I feel honored and humbled as Professor Fresco Luis has been a shero of myself, of myself of sorts. Luis, a professor, Luis Fresco is a professor, author, and advisor in international agriculture research and development. She received her PhD in the tropical crop science from Wageningen University and served as professor of plant production systems and chair of the Department of Agronomy at that same institution. 
Most recently, Louise held the role of president of the Wageningen University and Research Executive Board and is a professor there. She's also serving in that capacity from 2014 through 2022, and she was presented to Norman E. Borlock Medallion by the World Food Prize Foundation in June 2020. From 1997 to 2006, Louise held various positions and one of the remarkable one at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations as Assistant Director General. From 2006 to 2014, she was also Professor of Foundations of Sustainable Development in International Perspectives at the University of Amsterdam. She was number 22 on the list of top 200 most influential Dutch people and she was awarded the Com uh, Cominius Pri Prize in 2004. As you can see, Louisa has served in various capacities and always as a leader of change, a changer, a visionary, a very well-renowned uh, speaker and thought leader. That in numerous national and international institutions like the Royal Swedish Academy of Agriculture and Forestry, the, uh, uh, the, Real Academy, uh, the Real Academia de Ingeniería in Spain, the CJR, the Asian Vegetable Research Development Center in Syrup, she served as president of the Advisory Council for Research on Nature and Environment in the Netherlands, vice chair of the Council of the United Nations University, and she's a member of the Trilateral Commission, the supervisory board of Rabobank, and of course, a crown member of the, so uh, the Social and Economic Council of the Netherlands. She currently serves also as non-executive director of Unilever and has, a, and has been appointed as a member of the Royal Academy of Arts and Sciences, as well as a member of the Independent Review Committee of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change or the IPCC of the Inter Academy, uh, Academy Council. Louisa, once again, thank you for being our last speaker of 2023 in the Catalyst of Change series. We couldn't have hoped for a better voice here present today. Thank you, everyone. Over to you. Thank you very much, Bram. Thank you, everybody. Um, it's such a pleasure to be able to talk to you. And in fact, in itself, the fact that I can sit at home in my rather messy um, study, as you can see, which I wanted you to see because um, after hearing my CV, you probably think I'm a perfect person, which is far from the truth. So you see, I have my messy side as well. But the fact that I can do this is so much also a reflection of science and of technology and of advancement. And it's such a real pleasure to see that there are things we can do now that we could not do 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, my first job was in Papua New Guinea, my first serious job, actually for the United Nations. And the only thing I could do in terms of communication was write letters. And just to give you a sense of how things have changed, I would write to my mother. Um, the letter would take six weeks and it would take another six weeks to get the letter back. So in all, if she replied directly, it would take three months. The only means of communication out in the bush where I was serving on the um, border with Iria Jaya was actually a two-way radio. But within two months, um, lightning struck the radio and I had no means of communication anymore. Well, that sounds pretty dismal. Yet uh, it's through those things that we've learned a lot. And it's also that perspective in time, that perspective of how technology has helped us, that has always driven me forward. So now when I look back for it, um, I stepped down, as you may know, from Wageningen last year. Um, it's wonderful to see how much we have achieved, even if there's still a lot to do. So, I mean, there are lots of things I could tell you, and I know I'm I'm very fortunate to have Rahel to actually um, interview me. So maybe let me just give you a few keywords, not so much about who I am, but how I um, how I've sort of interpreted the world around me, how I've tried to work towards a greater goal that I think you all uh, share, and that's the feeling that we should try and make the world a better place, starting with food and agriculture health, employment, and so on. So the first thing I, uh, maybe let's that just be a, an ABC of, of things to, to look at. I think the first thing that for me, looking backwards has been very important is to be assiduous. And assiduous means to be dutiful, to work hard, not to be uh, afraid of uh, spending energy. If you don't understand something, ask for it, but to really be committed to working. 
And this may seem strange and obvious because many people will say, of course, you have to work hard. But working hard comes at a price. And that's something you have to realize when you're much younger, that uh, you cannot always have your cake and eat it. Sometimes you have to sacrifice something for work. And balancing that sacrifice, balancing what it is you want to do for work and what you want to do in your private life is, is really very important. It's not easy. You have to ask advice. So A is also the letter of advice. Don't be shy to ask advice. Um, don't uh, think you know everything or you need to know everything when you're 30 or 35 or 40 or even older, but be diligent, do work. Um, I have worked under actually quite uh, primitive conditions as you already heard from my Papua New Guinea work, but also uh, many years in Africa without any decent communications and uh, all kinds of military troubles in particularly in the Congo. But still, um, this idea of commitment, I think, is a very important one. So that's, in a way, my, my, um, my letter A and my letter B, ABC, would be um, to think about the big picture. You know, when you, you are in science or you're managing something, you tend to be really bogged down by, by all the details and you just look from day to day. And it, you have so much work sometimes, and especially when you work hard, it's it's really difficult. Um, and sometimes you feel alone. Uh, and sometimes you feel people don't appreciate you, especially if you're the lone woman around, or maybe you're appreciated for the wrong reasons, which may also happen. So um, B is really for the big picture. Even if you're bogged down by details, by things that are not easy, Think about where you want to go. Think about what it is you want to achieve. We don't all need to have a role which really changes the world. I think that happens only to very few people and mostly they're politicians. But you do want to achieve something. All that energy needs to go somewhere. And I often think that the, the fact that I've seen the big picture of where we are going um, is has been really uh, very instrumental in my life. And, just to give you an example, for at least 20 years, if not more, um, genetic modification was a, and is still in many countries, a really controversial subject. Yet I've always taken the stance that we should use the tools that we have. We should use the tools, even if it's difficult to use them, if, even if there are concerns, and we should be extremely careful and precautions should be taken. But let's not... Um, forget about the potential that science also offers us. And genetic modification, now, in fact, uh, in a way, we have CRISPR-Cas, which is a, a real step forward. But the fact that we, we need to think about genetics uh, has always been important to me. And I've always advocated not being afraid of genetics, but being, of course, obviously not naive. And so that, that in itself was the bigger picture. Even when everybody said to me, and I got lambasted many times, oh, this is dangerous, this is working with the private sector, this is, um, you know, you're creating monsters and Frankenstein and what have you. I've always felt that if we do the right science, even if nobody sees it, I will continue to talk about it and try to promote re really good work in this field. So that that is one idea of having the big picture. The big picture, of course, doesn't mean that you should be naive. It doesn't mean thinking that everything solves itself uh, or that, um, you know, somehow um, there will be peace on earth. That's not the big picture. But knowing that you're standing here and that you want to go there is, I think, uh, a really important part of life. And then um, maybe in my ABC, I think um, the... The C is both for commitment, which is already a little bit what I said before on working assiduously, but committing yourself, not just to the work, but also to partners, to working with others, because you cannot do it alone. And uh, I have I worked a lot with uh, institutions uh, in many parts of the world. And right now I'm still involved in, in Africa in setting up some funding for universities to exchange uh, students. So not having African students going to the US or to Europe, but African students within Africa rotating along this different universities. Those kinds of things for me are, are really a way of um, committing to, to, to partnerships, to doing things in a responsible way. Um, 
But of course, as in all lives, coincidence, the sea of coincidence, plays an important role because there are many things you cannot plan. Um, I, for one, never planned to become either the Deputy Director General of FAO nor the uh, the head of Wageningen University and Research. Those things you cannot think of when you're 25 or even when you're 45. It's Because many things also depend on being somewhere um, and uh, knowing that there is an opportunity. But once there is an opportunity, don't be afraid. That's that's a very important thing. So the A is also a little bit about afraid or rather about not being afraid. Sometimes you have to jump in. And I remember very well when I became the head of the agronomy department in Wageningen. And Wageningen at the time, of course, was a totally male organization. I was the second woman professor to be appointed there and immediately head of the agronomy department. And I came the first day um, and they said to me, okay, we have uh, 25 laborers, we have 15 tractors, and we have 200 cows, and we have 200 hectares of land. What do you want us to do? Well, I can. you can imagine that was not easy. Um, just to have the credibility to think of a plan, although there were, of course, ongoing plans, but to think of ways of making that, that enormous amount of land also useful and, and all the costs that were involved. So with a stroke of luck, one of the things I did is I, I started immediately to think about collaboration with others. And after a few years, maybe even two years, I managed to have an agreement with my colleagues down the road who were in plant breeding, the ones even further down the road who were in entomology, uh, the soil scientists. And we actually pooled our land and tried to do some um, integrated testing. And we sold off some of the other land and had a budget for doing more research. Well, that was certainly not conventional, but I'm very glad I did it because it helped us to collaborate. It also helped us to think about things uh, in a new way. And we called it um, the, you know, the Unifarm, the name is still there at Wageningen, the United uh, University sort of farming experience. And um, I'm, I'm very pleased to see that after all those years, that integrated concept is still there. So sometimes you have to be brave. You always have to be assiduous, always work hard, be committed, um, find your partnerships, and don't be afraid to ask. Now, lastly, maybe a last few comments, does it make a difference to be a woman or not? I've always asked myself that question because in many ways, I was so much the exception. There were so few women in my time that that was an advantage and a disadvantage. It was an advantage in the sense that people would remember me because there was no other woman, but it was a disadvantage because they always would think I would serve the coffee and and um, you know type up the minutes and so on. Um, and the, the trick is to find a balance there, not to get upset when people treat you like a secretary. My um, uh, best revenge in that respect uh, has been that one day, just after arriving at uh, at FAO, I was standing in a corridor and somebody pushed some papers into my face and said, photocopy. I was standing around the corner from a photocopier that I didn't even know yet. Anyway, I made the copies, I gave him the copies. And two days, days later, the same man was in a meeting with me, a meeting that I was chairing as the then director of research. I never said anything. He didn't either, but I think he got the message. So sometimes it's very good to be delicate about these things. And I think you, um, I cannot see you as an audience, but I think generally speaking, you're very lucky to live in a time now where um, it's not only acceptable to be a woman in science or in outreach or in agriculture, but it's also um, an advantage uh, because you you have the strength of numbers and many men really want to see good women making strides forward. So it's a very different world. Yet, lastly, it's not an easy world. Today's political, geopolitical tensions, um, the concerns we have about food and agriculture, about the effects of food and agriculture on the um, planet, the need to really come forward with solutions for a sustainable future that is still very much with us. So let that be our task for the future. And thank you very much for giving me a chance to give this introduction. Okay.
Thank you, Louise. I'm really honored and humbled to be having a conversation with you and to interview you. Hi, everyone. My name is Rahel Asafa. I'm a regional program manager for Africa based in Addis Ababa and a member of the Women in Crop Science Group. I'm excited to interview Louise to learn from her expertise in agriculture and food, her strong support of research and innovation, and her enthusiasm for lifelong learning. Louise's broad international experience and work in multilateral programs provide a fascinating global perspective that I believe all of us, myself and the audience, will find interesting. So Louise, thank you. Yes, so my questions will focus on women and the role of women, obviously. Sure. Yeah. And, um, my, my first question is, can you share a tough situation you faced as the head of an academic board and how you handled it? Um, yes, I, I am. I have served on, on, on many boards, uh, both as a member, as a chair, and, and of course at Wageningen, and I, I was the chair. Um, in some ways, being a woman or not doesn't make a whole lot of difference. I, I still feel that what makes up a person or a personality is in a way, um, you know, or let me put it differently. A person is like an iceberg and there's only a small portion of that that's above water. And that is the part where you see that somebody is a woman or a man um, and has other characteristics. Uh, but a large part of the personality, in a way, is down below the, the, the water level. And that's also important in seeing how people react. So I've always tried to do justice to the whole personality and not just to being a woman or a man. I must say, one of the uh, things that I've found difficult is... Um, seeing how you can promote women in a fair way because um, it is easy to say I want only a woman to apply or I only want to have uh, you know women considered for this position um, I have sometimes done that uh, and then occasionally that was not the best solution I remember very much at FAO I had I think 16 or 17 deputy directors below me or directors at the time and, and uh, service chiefs and when I started there was not one woman and I thought that is just not possible we're talking about uh, you know the end of the last century so 1998 and 99 um, and then I tried to recruit several women for the positions um, and against my own intuition I appointed two and in both cases it didn't work out not for them, not for the environment. Partly maybe I was also to blame for not giving them more guidance. Partly it was because um, they weren't up to the, the, the fierce competition. Um, and so although one left and one stayed, uh, that is really one of my um, less glorious moments in promoting women. But in general, I think I've been quite successful in, in getting uh, women to move and particularly to monitor um, how you know participation works at the lower levels you cannot expect to appoint directors if there isn't a broad basis and that's the mistake that many institutions make they think okay my, my god we now need a director but then if there isn't a broad basis and, and women haven't had enough experience then you're in for for very difficult situations you see what I mean yeah, yeah, I understand completely. And I guess um, that takes me to my next question. Perhaps this should start in academic settings. So how have you encouraged innovation and research in academic settings, um, particularly in areas related to women's role in food and agriculture or any of the fields that you were working in? Yeah, I think that the most important thing is that actually you start perhaps even at primary school. I mean, it should be obvious for children that that women can do the job as well as men. And in, in many ways, of course, now we're lucky to have some women leaders, both in politics and banking and so on. So it's, it becomes more obvious that you can have women leaders, that you can have, particularly in Africa, you have some very successful business women also. But all over the world, there should be role models, as, as was said just earlier. If you don't have an example where it works, it's going to be difficult to imagine that you can have that role as well. And certainly by the time children leave um, their secondary education and go to university, um, it should be obvious that they know what they want to do, whether they're a boy or a girl, 
uh, what their role can be, and that basically there is no fundamental difference in uh, the role of, of girls and boys. It, it's a matter of how you organize your life. And that's that's the original thing that I said before. You have to find a balance in your life. How much energy do you want to spend on your work or on something else? Um, so the, the, I think the best rule is still to be fair and to be objective and to be transparent because if you favor women over men, it also has an, a negative effect, not just on the women, but also on the men themselves. Um, and I think to make that discussion, uh, you know, open it up to everybody and say, how can we together find a balance? And you can occasionally, I've even recently still, I've pushed for an, a man to be appoint, appointed uh, instead of a woman because I just thought he would do a better job. Um, and sometimes that happens. But that doesn't mean that you then stop there. Then you have to ask yourself, how can we still promote women in that organization? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. We have to make sure that women are represented, but it has to be qualified women. So I, I definitely agree. Um, can you tell us how traveling to different places shaped your views on the challenges women face worldwide, especially in areas of food, um, agriculture and sustainability? Yeah, traveling is extremely important. And I would re recommend really to everybody, get out of your, your comfort zone, go somewhere where you don't know things, go to countries where, um, you know, maybe things are difficult. I was in many ways lucky. I think I lived in all for about eight years without running water and electricity. And not many people have that chance when they come from the kind of back, European background that I come from. And I found that extremely um it wasn't always easy, but I found it extremely enriching from a personal point of view, because to know what it means to even cook a meal, if you don't have electricity or gas and you have to do it on, on wood, um, you know, that changes life. It means that um, the women I worked with in Africa, they spent hours just getting firewood and uh and water and, um, you know, the basic foodstuffs. And if you don't, if you haven't experienced that yourself, you cannot imagine that. And uh, later in Asia also just walking around, uh, I did some uh, some work with Erie at some stage and uh, just walking in the rice fields barefooted with all the risks of, you know, getting parasitic diseases. I understood how hard it was for the women to bend over, you know, I don't know, 10,000 times per hectare to plant uh, a small rice seedling. So there are many, many things you have to do yourself and experience yourself in order to to know what it is to be a woman um, and to care for children. Uh, of course, I was also uh, in Africa and close by to the Sahel famine, which was the, the very big famine in the mid 1980s. And just seeing the suffering, I think has it really shaped my, my life. But um, that, that learning never stops. Even today, looking at the plight of immigrants in Europe, for example, or, or immigrants in the US at the Mexican US border, uh, you realize there is still so much to do for women. And, and that, that has never left me, that idea that it is not in balance. And what we must do as scientists or as extensionists is really try to bring science to bear to make their lives better. Yeah, I agree. And I've, I've read that continuous learning is important to you. Lifelong learning every day. You need to. You, there was a quote somewhere that uh, you said you have to learn every day. Yeah, How absolutely. Do you think learning every day benefits women specifically in their careers. But one thing I can advise everybody, and I'm still doing that uh, today, is to uh, take notes of things that um, you have noticed during the day or that you have learned or things you don't understand. Keep a kind of diary, not a personal diary saying it's 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 raining and mm -hmm. I'm not wearing my my blue dress, I'm wearing my gray dress, and uh, but more somebody says something or there is a sentence or there is something that comes to my mind and, and get a kind of reflective diary. That's, that is, I think, very important. Also, you must read. Reading is really important. It's not a uh, favorite nowadays. And I don't care whether you do it on Kindle or you read a, a book, but reading is one way um, to transport yourself to another world, especially if you read about things that are not your world. So don't read about people who are like you. Say if you're American and you only uh, read about American middle class women, that's not what I mean. But read about other periods, read about other lives, other people, other classes. 
I've always, when I traveled and I've traveled a great deal, I've always carried books from um, the authors of the country, country and or the country I was going. So when I go to Latin America, I read um, uh, Latin American writers, and that's how I uh, actually really devoured um, all of uh, Garcia Marquez, for example. When I go to Africa, I read African authors. Uh, and when I go to Asia, I read Asian authors, preferably women, but not exclusively. And that's a very good way of transporting yourself out of your, your own um, view, out of your own life. Uh, so yes, never forget to read and never forget to bring a book. And the number of times I've been on airplanes, delayed, uh, sitting in a traffic jam or broken bridges in Africa and so on. I've always been so happy that I always carried a stack of books in my rucksack. Do you have a favorite book or a top three favorite books? I don't want to put you on the spot, but it's just... Oh my God, me. I have, I mean, this whole house is full of books as you can. <laughs> there, there is so many uh, favorite books that I could think of. And it's usually also the book I'm um, I'm reading uh, at that very point in time. That's the one that's most um, uh, obvious. Um, and there's there's anything from, from way back past centuries. But what I've just read, maybe I can just mention that, is a very interesting, and this is also because of geo geopolitics. I just read uh, a book by a Palestinian British writer, a woman, Isabella Hamad, H-A-M-M-A-D. Uh, and it's called uh, Enter Ghosts. And it that's a reference to the fact that they are uh, with a group of um, uh, artists. They want to stage um, a play, Macbeth, by Shakespeare on the West Bank. And you can imagine that's a very difficult endeavor. And of course, it has all the echoes of a classical British play and the current political situation. And it's very, very cleverly done. And at the same time, the protagonist is also um, struggling with her own background, uh, with her, her marriage and so on. And so it, it weaves together politics and personal and, and artistic considerations. And just by reading something completely different, um, I really, really can recommend that. If there's one thing you want to do in life, read a book every week, at least one, of course. Oh, I fully agree. So I also read that you like music. So uh, can you tell us how your love of classical music, opera, and uh, we heard about the literature, influence your approach to leadership, particularly in supporting women? Yeah, I, th I, I think it's important to look at art in general. So not just mu music, but also paintings and so on. Um, uh, because it gives you a different dimension. And I think women in general are more sensitive to the, the nonverbal um, sort of more emotional signals that come from art and music. And it's not just classical music. There's a lot of what they call world music that I like very, very much. Um, but one of the things I, I often do is I bring female colleagues to go and, and see a play or go to a concert because it creates a kind of bonding. And at the same time, it gives us something else to talk about, which is not just about work. And it's important to realize that life is not just about work. It's basically not just what you do as a scientist, but also how you deal with your colleagues. And so in that sense, I... Uh, I, I really think um, going to some artistic, whatever it is, exhibition really can can help you to build bridges and and talk about it. You know, what do we see? Why do you see something differently for me? And and what is that? Uh, so even when I I was recently in 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 Pretoria, and of course I said I want to go to the museum. So they said, oh, that's not in the program. I said, well, let's make a make a quick dash for it. And then we did. And it was really, really very nice. And everybody enjoyed it. Well, that's great. So I also think you write, uh, and as a writer, how do you use storytelling to amplify women's voices and advocate for gender equality? Well, I don't write um, sort of explicitly uh, feminist novels um, in the sense that they're, you know, Novel writing is, and, and I do fiction and nonfiction. Novel writing is is obviously um, has to be nuanced. So so it's it's um, 
It is very important. And I must say, yes, I probably have more men than women in my book. So we'll have a look at that. But it's really about human values, I think. And and one of the last books I did, which unfortunately was not translated into English, is about um, but some about somebody that everybody in CGR knows about, um, the uh, Russian plant scientist Vavilov, Nikolai Vavilov, who was the discoverer of the um the centers of of origin of uh, of crops and it's a, if you don't know him it's really worth looking up and he was an extremely brave man and this this book is really about how can you be brave in the face of um um all that adversity this was under stalin so stalin didn't want objective science stalin wanted results and he kept on saying no we must collaborate with other countries and we must uh try to get seeds from everywhere in order to uh, to improve um not just our work but improve things for the whole world and that kind of of real moral courage from a scientist i think is extremely fascinating and it applies to both women and men yes i agree so just out of curiosity, did you have any women role models or anybody you looked up to to kind of give you um, or a mentorship or anything like that um, to guide you? Yeah, that's a very good question. And unfortunately, the answer is no, because when I went to university, uh, I was nearly the only girl, certainly in, in, in agronomy. Um, there were no I, I cannot remember having a female professor all my uh, all my time at university when I was a student. Um, I didn't have anybody, any women to look up to, or even women around in, in general, um, when I first started at the UN. So that wasn't the case. Um, but I'm aware of the fact that that works very well for women. So now in my current, or in the last, say, 10, 15 years, or even longer, I've certainly tried to really promote um, uh, that kind of mentorship with women, not just that I mentor young girls, but also that other women do that as well. And I think it's extremely um, positive if it is possible to do so, um, not just on, on women's issues, but in general, on, on how do you develop as an individual? What are your strengths and your weak points? Um, and I wish everybody had uh, had a... A kind of mentor it's 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 so really important to have that but a mentor is who's not just commiserating but really also saying okay here you have to work hard this is something you have to um change in yourself or you know uh it's not just a, a soft cushion on which you can lay your head and then think okay she approves but i think mentorship also for men for that mentor yeah um uh, I think young men also need, they're also struggling with who they are and where they go. And and I, I firmly believe, I think, uh, after all those years, that we cannot just emancipate women if we don't emancipate men as well. And and talk about, you know, fair sharing of, for example, household tasks and so on. Yes, so fair sharing and household tasks. And you touched upon this a little bit earlier where you said... Um, work-life balance, especially for women, especially um, mothers, could be uh, somewhat challenging. So do you have any advice for women in the workforce trying to have a work-life balance? And you said you can't have your, your yeah, cake and eat it too. So. Of course, it all depends. Um, I've seen examples of women who specialized very early in a very um, narrow field and became a top specialist. And therefore, they were always in demand. And they were very clever. They really thought early about how can I make myself so necessary that they cannot uh, walk away from me. So that was very, very clever model. So sometimes, and that only works in certain fields. So if you are a virologist um, and you you pick on this, this um, sort of shadow virus that nobody knows anything about, you may just be lucky and, and become the world expert on, uh, on that virus. Um, the other model that I've also seen is uh, get your children very early because most women delay until their mid thirties with all the, the tragedies of, you know, can you conceive or not, or even later than the mid thirties. Um, and then having more than one child is, is already in itself a problem. I uh, have seen uh, some friends of mine also who had children very, sometimes just due to sheer coincidence, 
uh, this is where the sea of coincidence comes in again, had one child very early, let's say at age 21, and had a second one soon after. And by the time the children were, were at secondary school, they, they could move full-fledged into a career. Now, of course, this only works if you have a husband for a start and a husband who also, or at least partner, I should say, who also approves of that. Um, and the third model I've seen is, um, you know, you cannot always rely on your own relatives to help you with child uh, care. That, that's just not possible. If you're working in, in CIMIT, you're, you're, you know, your parents may not even be around in, within hundreds of kilometers. Um, but creating a network of women to deal with child care together um, for example, at Wageningen, there was no, no real good kindergarten. So we set up something where women scientists could bring their children and have them there for a long, long time, even if they had to do, for example, lab work in the evenings. Um, now, of course, this is all complicated, and I'm not saying it's the best possible solution, but uh, creating a network of women who can help one another is, is really important. Uh, and and so you have to find a tailor-made solution, but don't delay it. Even thinking about it, don't delay it. That's great advice. So I, I love talking to you, but I need to wrap up, I think. So I'll ask you a final question. So given the challenges women still face today, how do you stay optimistic about progress in areas like women's roles in food, agriculture, science, and equity? Or do you remain optimistic? I'm extremely optimistic. I'm not always optimistic about the way I see the world moving, because I always see, um, you know, at least now that there is also a trend to go backwards on certain liberties and so on. But I think generally speaking, if you look again, this is the bigger picture. That's what I said might be. If you look back 50 years, or if I look at my own mother, you know, I started, I went to university about 50 years ago. This is half a century. That seems long, but it's not that long. My mother didn't even finish high school and not because she was poor, but just because it wasn't considered necessary. Even my sister um, did not go to university. And and so I think there is an enormous change in, in uh, the mentality all over the world. It's not considered strange that girls want to, to study. It's less and less strange that women have a leadership role. And yes, it is still complicated for women to have financial autonomy, and this is very much class dependent. But I think there is enormous progress. So again, there we should have our uh, our vision not on on today only, but you know, the next fifty years will bring us so many tools. Again, um, the fact that we can talk, uh, you are in others, people in 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 Mexico are listening to us in India. Uh, I'm sitting in Amsterdam. We can talk to one another as if we were in the same room. That is a fantastic achievement. Food will become also um, more easy to produce. I'm convinced of that. It will become more nutritious, uh, more safe. And all those things will help women in the end. Because everything having to do with food and health will women, even if they're not, will help women, even if they're not women farmers. So yes, I'm in that sense, I'm optimistic. And of course, I'm optimistic because so many women are so resilient and so willing to work and so willing to, to discover things. So there's absolutely no reason to be pessimistic in the longer term overall. Thank you very much. It has been delightful speaking with you and I have taken away some key lessons. Thank you. Isabel, I'm giving it back to you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, we appreciate very much uh, Luis and, and uh, Rahel for this very stimulating and enlightening conversation. Uh, now we would like to open the floor for questions from the audience. Uh, we invite you to raise your hand, to turn on your camera, and unmute yourself if you would like to ask a question or comment, or you can submit it via Slido, as you can see in the in our um, a page in the in the Zoom. So we have already received one uh, first question in, in the Slido. So I'm, I'm going to proceed to read the first one. Um, could you share your experience on writing your book, Hamburgers in Paradise? Is this something scientists should dedicate more time to? Oh, that's a fantastic question. Thank you very much for asking that question. Um, because I feel very strongly, not just about reading books, but also about writing books. Um, now I know, of course, not writing is not easy and it's something that you have to practice. It's, it's Writing is like cooking, you know, you have to combine a lot of ingredients together 
and and you have to think about how it will work out and the more you do it the better you get at it so uh, i always liken it to um, making a, a loaf of bread you know in the beginning it's all water and it's all sticky and nothing comes out but in the end you know there is this dough that goes into the oven and then you have your book or your bread so so yes it's really important to practice writing and i couldn't have written the the hamburgers in paradise which is well, I don't have a copy handy here, but it's it's quite a big book. Um, uh, oh, I might have here, yes, by chance. I have the Dutch version here, by chance, because I had to look up something. So you can see it's quite a big book. Um, but uh, I couldn't have done that if I hadn't had a lot of writing practice. Now, the question is, should everybody do that? No, I don't think everybody should do that. But I think in general, we don't do enough to reach out to the public. And this is not a scientific book in the sense that it's um, only meant for scientists, but every sentence is as scientific as possible. So I try to not say anything that is untrue or not backed up by fact, but I wanted to be very readable. And uh, for me, the pleasure is in explaining something complicated in a readable way and using a metaphor. So this book is called Hamburgers in Paradise, and it's really about two um, icons of our modern times, the fact that we have hamburgers everywhere and the history of hamburgers and the changing perceptions of meat, for example, but also paradise as, as a cultural concept in every culture nearly, which means that you know there is this magical garden where food just comes to you. And in, of course, that's also not true um, because food comes because we do a lot of effort. But the metaphor is interesting. So I, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about how can I involve the public in exciting images um, and in exciting ideas and, and uh, so that they, they think about things. Because I think the role of science is not just to produce results and getting um, you know a better strain of, of maize or, or corn, but also to make people think about the, the, the fantastic fact that most people in the world today do not live on a farm, don't grow their own food, yet they can be very safe in the thought that they are dependent on unknown farmers who are doing their utmost to produce food. And that is a magical thing. So this book has also all kinds, I, I'll try to see that, all kinds of illustrations. One of them, yeah, you can probably not see that, but anyway, one of them is is uh, from um, the current boundaries a country bound, uh, called now Iraq, which has a fantastic uh, set of pottery with um, calves and cows and, and the way uh, you know, it's done with so much love, that poverty, that you see that even at that time, we're talking 3,000 years ago, people were already impressed by animals and their relationship and they cared about animals. And so just a little detail like that can just pique a reader's um, uh, interest and, and, and a belief in, you know, that you're part of a long tradition. So should you all write? No because um, there are already a lot of books and it's hard to get them published and it's a lot of work and there's no success. But if you can, and you start with brief articles or you do little things on, on the internet or you make a little YouTube film, yes, by all means, reaching out is really important in a time now when there's also so much lack of trust in science. Thank you, thank you. Um, Claudia, Claudia is raising her hand. Would you please open your micro and your camera? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Luis, it's a, such an honor to have you here today. Uh, I have two questions for you. So first is, in your experience, how does diversity in leadership contributes to innovation and problem solving in, within the agricultural industry or academic institutions? And the second question is, are there specific leadership qualities or skills that you believe are more prevalent or impactful among women leaders? Yeah, that's a very interesting question as well. Um, in general, I would say, yes, diversity is important. But again, it's not just only gender related. I think diversity in backgrounds, in ethnicity, in disciplines, um, uh, all that is important. Uh, you probably know the saying about Lehman Brothers, you know, the big bank that failed. And um, the saying was, if it had been Lehman Sisters, they wouldn't have collapsed. 
I don't think it's Lehman Brothers or Sisters, but it's they had only accountants there. And it's the diversity of disciplines, which is probably as and the diversity of culture within a bank or within an institution that is important. But the more diverse people are, the more viewpoints you have on the condition that you have leadership that recognizes the diversity. And this links immediately into your second question. What are the characteristics of a leadership that actually brings out the best in diversity? And I think that, that being able to listen, being able to respect differences of viewpoint, being able to be patient, uh, but not so patient that no decision ever comes <laughs> across. Uh, all that is is really important. Um, and for example, I've always tried to remain very informal. So I always say to people, just use my first name. And uh, when I had, even when I had big meetings, I would always serve the coffee myself just to break the ice and make people feel more relaxed. And um, giving time to people to to come across with their ideas, even if there's they're crazy ideas. And I sometimes in a meeting, I would have the last five minutes, I would ask people, is there anybody with a crazy idea? You know, just to open the door to to things that that people perhaps don't dare to say or or feel well, you know, I cannot really talk about this. So it's there are some skills that you can use. Um, also, what I sometimes did is when I had big meetings, I would ask people just to talk with their neighbor for three minutes about a problem and find a solution together and then get all the solutions. Because some people are more free when they talk face to face with somebody instead of in a big meeting. All that is not just only diversity, but diversity certainly helps. And um, it also helps to have, um, what shall I say, uh, room for mistakes. You know, uh, the, the, the trouble with leadership is that leaders don't dare to make mistakes and certainly don't dare to admit that they make mistakes. And that is also something you have to overcome. So you have to make sure that you organize your own critical uh, surroundings that people dare to say, hey, listen, I don't think this is a good idea. And that so that not everybody... Um, dares to do that. And it's also something you have to grow into. I couldn't have said this in this same way 30 years ago, of course. That's true. <laughs> and nobody wants to admit what goes wrong, <laughs> but it's, yeah. it's learning. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you, Louis. Um, there is another question from uh, Slido. Your professional journey is impressive. Which of the roles do you believe has contributed the most to your purpose or the legacy you wish to leave? Oh, that's a difficult question because I, I actually think that, you know, a career, if you may call it that way, I don't even call it so much that myself, but mm -hmm. is a combination of steps. And it's like a ladder. If, you know, if one of the, uh, the steps disappears then the whole ladder collapses. So mm -hmm. it's not to say that every next step is a logical consequence of the previous one. But you learn, again, because you keep on learning, every step is important. And for example, I couldn't have done Wageningen if, if I hadn't had such a long experience in the UN, because that gave me a way to build up that university, which was, um, you know, a very high ranking, but very Dutch university, into a really international institution. <clears throat> and if I hadn't been in the UN, I wouldn't have been... Um, involved in the same way with the CGIR because I led the FAO delegation to the CGIR many, many years. Although I was involved with the CG before, uh, it gave me a chance to really consolidate all the collaboration both in the UN and with other countries and so on. <clears throat> but maybe the most important thing is after all, you have to keep on um, teaching and you have to keep on really uh, trying to explain Yes, possibly also through a book, but really to also interact with young people, especially when you become more important in a way, you become more in a leadership role. The tendency is to only talk with people at your level. I would still go and teach first year students regularly and not on a full course, but but giving lectures to them. And I think that that is really important. So you you don't le lose um, your sense of perspective. And, and students are often um, not yet impressed by who you are or they don't even know. So they um, they can actually ask questions that other people don't, don't ask anymore. And so, um, you know, diversity is, doesn't only mean diversity in your own group, but, but it also means 
going out and looking for a diverse opportunities for yourself to continue learning and interacting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so, you know Simit very well, and we are strongly wanting um, to create a culture where everybody is accountable, no matter where they are in the organization. Do you have uh, tips for us? Yeah, that's an interesting concept. Um, I, I think, first of all, um, you know, the word accountability uh, is very loaded and, and, and it's a difficult concept. So you have to make clear what do we mean by accountable that, so that it doesn't sound as something negative whereby somebody gets punished because they do something wrong. But it's, it's more about commitment and collaboration. And that concept needs to be really clear for everybody. Then secondly, I think organizing groups for example, around a strategic plan or something like that, organizing groups with different levels. So from the youngest, least experienced to the higher up uh, science leaders, the groups should be diverse and they should think together. So don't do not do work where, where you have the top saying, okay, we need a new strategy, for example. And so we have somebody talking it down all the way down, but getting a bottom-up perspective and bottom-up collaboration and build buying into the concepts uh, and getting these these groups that are vertical rather than horizontal, I think would be really important. Um, and maybe there you can uh, try and use things like um, starting a blog for the whole institution and uh, giving everybody a chance to say something and, and you know you have to limit it so everybody gets 100 words or something like that but and then you give a little prize for the best idea or uh, the best way of communicating or something like this you have to build on a little bit of um, not severe competition but you know this desire to do to do it well and to be seen that's a very important strong personal desire in most people Thank you, you see so what I mean? Oh, sorry. <laughs> you see what I mean? Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. Thank you. Um, what is uh, your top learning about why women are not getting the knowledge of their contributions in agriculture? In science, you mean, or in general? Um, agriculture, in science, yeah, in general, or in general as well. I think... Uh, women are not as good as men in what I would call the one-liners. So, um, you know, if you are somewhere and you have to, um, you know, impress a crowd of men or impress an audience or um, apply for a new job or, um, you know, talk to a minister of agriculture, the key issue is that you know what you want to say and you need to have a one-liner or two-liners, but a really concise message. And there's there's ample research that shows that women need more uh, words than men and are not necessarily always as concise. And so being very precise and, and saying, you know, for example, women will say, okay, I'm going to contribute to this and that, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to build partnerships, and I'm going to do this and this and that. You've lost them already by the third point. If you're there and you say, I'm going to build the best possible partnership in the world. We'll stop. They will listen. Now, this sounds like an easy trick, but something, um, I think, a bit of self-reflection for women on how we communicate and how we do it really in a forceful way that will really help. And this is something you can practice with your female colleagues. You know, stand in front of the crowd and let everybody criticize you. And practice also in front of the mirror. You know, give you what is your top line sentence? Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Louis, for your great talk. Um, so now I would like to invite uh, Brian Goberts, Director General of CIMI, to official close the event. Yes. Dr. Goberts, over to you. Thank you, thank you. Isabel, and, and especially thank you to Louisa for great tips. And, and I can see already several of us standing in front of the mirror and trying to uh, impress ourselves with uh, with the very clever uh, ones. It also that applies to men, in fact, this whole mirror <laughs> thing, oh, not just women. <laughs> Thank you. A general advice for all of us. And let me highlight that uh, I, this was a fantastic talk. And I think you touched upon our strategic science and innovation objective number five, where we want to inspire force of transformation in others, including the general public. But also I noticed writing was a nice red thread 
throughout your talk, writing a blog, a book, writing down, just scribbling new ideas we all found. And last but not least, a golden insight I take away, enjoy beauty in any form, anytime you can. Art to inspire yourself to be a better leader of any kind, of any sort. Thank you very much, Luisa, for uh, joining us in this uh, talk. And I would like to invite the public. We have ended the 2023 Leaders of Change, Catalyst of Change um, series at a high note. And I know we're going to start 2024 also on a high note. Let's find out together who's up next. Before I was a senior research scientist at NASA, and long before the World Food Prize changed my life, my husband and I lived on a farm in Italy, raising chickens, goats, pigs, and harvesting olives and grapes. But since then, I've learned that farms like ours aren't just plots of land. Our conception of the farm also has to extend upward two satellites orbiting, the, orbiting thousands of kilometers in the exosphere. It has to extend outward to the biolabs, scientists, policymakers, and more, and to all of you. Here's why. For most of history, agriculture has been a long, slow process of evolution. Farmers worked independently, tweaking and perfecting their practices over centuries. But that process of slow adaptation won't work anymore. The climate is changing faster than at any point in the last 10,000 years, any point since the farmer planted the first seed. In 2010, I co-founded an organization called AgMIP. It stands for Agricultural Model Intercomparison and Improvement Project. It's a global network of more than 1,000 researchers who build and use crop models, climate models, economic models, and more. We lean on our community of scientists to share information, and we tap into artificial intelligence to help synthesize all sorts of data, remote sensing, crop modeling, climate data. This approach means better, more responsive science, which leads to better, more responsive farms. These advances are only possible with collaboration. Collaboration between scientists, policymakers, and farming groups. It's the only way to get the information in all of our many AgMIP models to farmers all around the world, the people who really need them. In the end, collaboration is how we sow the seeds of progress. Please join our next seminar in the Catalyst of Change series on January 16th.